Mr. Latimer, thank you for meeting with us uh, to discuss uh, the history in Tulsa and in particular in the Greenwood District. If you'll just start by uh, just some of the simple facts, so telling us uh, your full name, when you were born, uh, family members, and, and your relationship to Tulsa. Oh, okay. Uh, well, my name is Caesar C. Latimer, Jr., and I was uh, born in Tulsa, Oklahoma, 1960. Uh, born at Morton Health Center uh, Hospital at that time, about uh, two blocks from uh, my home. Um, have uh, two other brothers, uh, Malcolm and Verlin. They they live in Denver. <clears throat> I mean, Oklahoma City and Denver, respectively. And uh, just kind of grew up in the neighborhood. Um, they, my family had a business, Latimer's Barbecue, at the corner of Pine and Greenwood and grew up around that business. Uh, my father was an attorney, and my mother, uh, Emily Latimer, was a nurse, and I just kind of grew up in a closely knit neighborhood. Where was uh, your house exactly located? Uh, on the corner of Queen and Frankfurt Place, um, again, about two or three blocks from the uh, intersection of Greenwood and Pine, and about two blocks from Morton Hills, Morton Hospital. And would you describe that neighborhood as the Greenwood District? Did you ever refer to it as that growing uh, up? Well, not the Greenwood District, we just called it Greenwood. You called it Greenwood? Greenwood, yes. I definitely. see, I see. And uh, would you describe your uh, your education and religion for us? Um, I'm, I'm a Baptist, attend uh, First Baptist Church in North Tulsa. Okay. Spent a few years in the Church of God in Christ while in Oklahoma City. My brother's a pastor, a bishop of the Church of God in Christ. So uh, I was under his uh, pastorage for quite some time, um, and um, graduated from Langston University, okay. uh, bachelor's in uh, business administration. In the uh, the grammar school you went to, in junior high and high school, uh, started in Dunbar Elementary, um, and then transitioned over to uh, the Catholic private school, uh, Immaculate Conception. Uh, it's no longer around, and then went into Bishop Kelly. Into Bishop Kelly. Mm -hmm. And how would you describe the the racial um, makeup of Dunbar Elementary School? It was uh, predominantly African American, probably 100% African American. Uh, had a, it was a close knit type of uh, school. Remember the teachers uh, knew it, knowing most of the teachers personally, uh, in and outside of school. Uh, matter of fact, I referred to some of them, some of them as my aunt, and, you know, uncles. Very close knit community. Well, we're here today to talk about uh, the events of 1921, Tulsa race riots, um, as they're referred to, and how that story gets passed down through the, the ages, through, through generations. Do you recall when you first heard, or approximately when you first heard about the riot? Yes, uh, it was uh, quite a shock to me. Um, I was in college um, attending, uh, probably, I was in algebra class, uh, Dr. Clarence Love, was my instructor, and one day after class, uh, got to talking, and he was telling me, you know, I told him I was from Tulsa, and he knew that, and uh, he started sharing some things to me. He showed, shared with me a book, and I cannot remember the title of the book, but it was a book by him, uh, talking about the Tulsa race riot, and I was just flabbergasted because I had never heard of such an event. I never knew that uh, this event had occurred. And as I learned more and more about it, it just blew my mind that such an event took place in Tulsa. After reading the book, did you ask questions of teachers, family members? Oh yes, definitely. Um, began questioning, you know, information about the race riot and uh, sharing that information with friends of mine, and they were just blown away as well to 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 find out that such an event occurred in Tulsa, and. Um, you know, just inquiring, asked my parents about it, um, and they shared information that they knew reluctantly. I believe probably at that time uh, parents were trying to shelter us from uh, discrimination and racism as best as possible, and so therefore they uh, neglected to share that information, not wanting us to see uh, the negative side of human humanity, I guess. Do you recall any early incidents that made you look at the ugly side of humanity? Oh, yes, uh, several instances. I remember, uh, I believe it was Borden Cafeteria um, going in and being rejected and asked to leave. Um, I remember going down Brookside, uh, 
one night with my parents and uh, uh, it was after dark and he gave me some racial slurs and saying about you need to get back to your side of town and uh, that was just kind of kind of scary for me because I was a young kid and you know and, and being sheltered and then being thrust into that environment it was uh, kind of an eye-opening experience you know. When you then went to uh, junior high school, it was Immaculate Conception. Yes. Did the was the uh, student body there um, diverse? Yes, it was. Yeah, the student body there was a uh, very diverse, and uh, probably where I became uh, more closely interacting with other races, mm -hmm. and uh, it was really no big deal at that time. Um, the um, uh, they were, it was operated by, by nuns, uh, or, well the nuns were the teachers, and uh, they tried to be as fair as possible. Uh, and so we just, you know, just kind of got along uh, with white, white kids and black kids, Indians, uh, just different races, ethnic and, groups. And would you describe your experiences then at Bishop Kelly for high school? Uh, yes, it kind of took a uh, turn, a downward turn at that point. Um, I don't know, uh, well, all of the teachers were not uh, uh, nuns or b our brothers, should I say. They had uh, just, I guess they call late regular uh, people, instructors. And you started seeing a uh, difference in treatment. Uh, there was some variances as far as like, uh, just simply trying to respond to a question in class and some students were not uh, acknowledged uh, now, if you were an uh, athlete, of course, you, know, you had uh, spe special privileges, but uh, th there were some negative instances there, yes. Mm -hmm. Back to the, the events of the riot, uh, again, what we'd like to know is how the story gets told and, and passed along. So, uh, I guess what I'm going to ask you now is if you'll simply tell me, as you understand it, the, the story um, of how it started, and um, I suppose we could start with... Uh, what you know about Dick Rowland and, and Sarah Page. Right. Um, the way I understand it, there was an incident on the elevator where supposedly uh, the young man <clears throat> said something to the young lady. I've heard two versions. That first he whistled, either he whistled or said something to her or that uh, someone found it inappropriate for them to both be on the elevator at the same time alone. And that, uh, and that she was uh, offended and she made some kind of remark and uh, it kind of just escalated from there. And uh, then I uh, understand that he was uh, detained at uh, the jail and uh, several members of the African American community uh, were inquiring about his uh, well-being and the purpose for his being detained, reasons for being detained, and uh, then the two, then African Americans and Caucasians kind of on each side of a I guess the sidewalk or whatever you um, began interacting negatively with each other and then it escalated and uh, and then uh, it just grew into a big brawl the way I understand it. And yep, go ahead. Have you had you growing up after learning about the, the riot, had you then or after that point, did you ever talk with anyone who was directly involved? No, no. Uh, because um, Though we learned about the riot, we weren't, uh, I didn't really know who was actually involved or impacted until um, there were documentaries after the fact of, uh, about the race riot and you started watching those and you said, oh, I know that person, but I didn't know they were involved because you didn't, I mean, by me being uh, such, coming into the, uh, to Tulsa so late, had no idea who was involved, who was in Tulsa, whatever, but I knew a lot of the uh, race riot survivors but by the time I learned that there were race riot survivors, it was usually due to their, their passing or, like I said, by the time the documentary came around. You knew them as, as individuals in the community, but right. not as race, race riot survivors. survivors. Right, and that's, again, that was just another element of the shocking that, you know, it's like knowing a uh, Pearl Harbor survivor, right. that, you know, seeing them every day, but you never knew that they, they were in Pearl Harbor. And then one day you find out, you're like, wow, man. You know, but, uh, so it's one of those type of things. Mm -hmm. yeah. when, when you started then uh, researching and talking to people about it, um, can you describe how, um, how it was told to you, the events following um, Dick Rowland's arrest, 
what followed from that, what followed in terms of the attack uh, on the neighborhood. Because really, that that's not a riot. That's really a, a different kind of story. The, the response to the city, right? And now I and, and and I've heard many references to that uh, that it wasn't really a riot. It was more like a massacre. Um, and I can understand it was um, told that uh, uh, the airplane was used. Now I don't know if it was used for observation. Some say that it was used to fire to fire upon uh, citizens of Tulsa. And it was I've heard that it was the National Guard's plane, or, and then it was um, a private plane used by the Tulsa Police Department. Uh, those details I don't, really do not know, um, but um, they used air support, as we call it, as an advantage over uh, the uh, Greenwood community. Uh, a lot of uh, robbing and pillaging of uh, African American homes. Uh, we all know that Greenwood was kind of like the Black Wall Street of the time, and so there were a lot of wealthy African Americans that had uh, lots of uh, luxurious items or homes or uh, furnishings or jewelry. And uh, it was my understanding that a lot of those homes were uh, 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 burnt, well, robbed and then burned uh, to the ground. And then I also heard things, something like uh, they had containment camps, which uh, is akin to concentration camps that we know about, uh, where they put Af uh, they held African Americans until they could, I guess, get control of the city of the uh, of the city. So yeah, I heard about different things like that. Where were the the camps um, located? Uh, that I do not know. I, I it was my understanding that I guess the area around Apache and Frankfurt. I'm not sure. I really don't know. But I just heard that they were that most of the African Americans were moved north. And I knew I know North Tulsa did not exist then as it does today. So I'm not sure exactly the area. How has it changed when you say that it did not exist then as it does today? In what specific ways? Well, when I was coming up, mm -hmm. uh, Greenwood had, uh, uh, had had a rebirth, I guess. Not to the point it did back in the 20s. But there were uh, uh, African-American businesses all up and down Greenwood. Lawyers' offices, doctors, dentists, grocery stores, movie theaters. Uh, there were all types of things. And uh, I really do not remember any vacant areas up and down Greenwood, between Greenwood and Archer. I remember it being uh, nightclubs, uh, restaurants, um, I remember uh, the location of Amos T. Hall's office, um, and I don't remember, I, wouldn't, I was too young to know about hotels, but I understand it was a hotel there, and apartment complexes, I remember the brickyard up on the hill. So it was a very flourishing area that Greenwood and Lansing uh, was very flourishing and uh, uh, yeah, that's what I remember about it. And were the clientele primarily African American or was there a mixed clientele? Um, there was probably, there was a mixed clientele. I remember seeing uh, different ethnic groups, uh, members of different eth ethnic groups, uh, uh, frequent businesses on Greenwood, um, Latimer's for example. Uh, I remember uh, a wide variety of clientele there. I remember hearing history, though, that uh, that uh, the uh, city of Tulsa required uh, my grandfather to uh, separate the races within his business and wanted him to put up a wall to uh, separate. And I believe he, um, I can't remember if he did or not. He said he didn't want to, but uh, they, uh, uh, I guess, due to some negative uh, coercing, I guess, they decided to separate the races. But when I came along, the wall was not there and uh, races kind of just intermingled with each other. So this was either prior to your having been born or it was, oh, yeah, it was yes. too early? To oh, yes, 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 yes. In, in the 50s or 40s? Right. Even. right I see, right. I see, I see. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to move over here for a second. This is uh, an interesting question. Please describe any progress, uh, as you see it, that the city of Tulsa has made in terms of race relations in the decades since the riots. Well, uh, the, the city, Tulsa has, as far as race relations, has seemed to have been on a type of a roller coaster 
right? Uh, there are times when uh, different ethnic, ethnic groups seem to get along and seem to do well. And then there are times when the city sometimes seems to want to stag stagnate the growth of North Tulsa. Like I said, um, there were, when I came up, the Greenwood area um, uh, was flourishing, had uh, rebuilt itself, and then urban renewal came through under the uh, practices of improving the neighborhood. But actually, uh, what it did is it uh, uh, basically eliminated or destroyed uh, most of the African American businesses along Greenwood, where Greenwood was a a uh, financial district, it has now become a residential area. And uh, my father and I have had several discussions of the number of African American businesses that uh, reside in North Tulsa and how it has dwindled. And uh, and I know economics plays a lot into that. And uh, well, I just kind of what well, we have kind of come to the conclusion rather that urban renewal was kind of uh, the understanding that if you bought out black businesses that the family members would take the money and separate and go their separate ways rather than put it back into the businesses and that's basically what happened and so instead of uh, businesses that were kind of just kind of hanging on and, and st instead of rebuilding and and improving their businesses, uh, the money just scattered. Yes. And what was the, the result of acquiring the businesses? What, what was the urban renewal project? Well, it was my understanding, again, I was, I'm trying to remember, uh, I was out of Tulsa for quite some time, but it was my understanding that urban renewal was to redevelop the neighborhood, improve the housing uh, areas, and, uh, you know, just buy up old homes and put newer homes there. Uh, but most of the homes that were erected were, were, in essence, the people that they bought the homes for, for from, rather, they weren't able to go back and into those neighborhoods and buy again. They had to move to apartments or other areas of the city which, which had cheaper housing. So therefore, it basically just kind of wiped out the neighborhood. It may have it probably did have good intentions, but it didn't occur to the way that, that well, it, it didn't sustain the neighborhood, I don't believe. And do you know um, approximately which which blocks were affected by urban renewal? I mean, we're sitting here off of Greenwood. Is This would be the heart of... Yes. Uh, well, uh, this was, if I remember, I believe it started in this area. Uh, I remember they had... Uh, Dunbar was somewhere in this area. I can't remember my streets. Uh, they also had the, uh, uh, I think they called it the Negro Credit Union. Uh, it was in this area. And uh, uh, then the brickyard was probably where uh, part of OSU sits, if I remember, or Langston University sits, resides rather. and. Uh, I remember clearing out this neighborhood, and uh, this area was vacant for quite some time, and then it just kind of marched north down Greenwood, and uh, all of the offices, businesses, grocery stores, there was Union Baptist Church on Greenwood, I believe they got caught up in that, um, funeral homes, the only, the only thing I remember on Greenwood that's there now is First Baptist Church, Carver Middle School, and um, there's a, another church uh, down the street, and that was the only only built structures I remember that were there back in the '60s. And of course, for the Greenwood, the uh, Tecumseh Barber Shop, and all those buildings. It's amazing. Well, um, would you describe your views on how well or how poorly the race riot is acknowledged today, and um, perhaps ways that it could be uh, better acknowledged? Well, they have the uh, Center for Reconciliation that they're erecting at this point, uh, the John Hope Center for Recon Reconciliation, and that's a good start. Um, there's been talk about reparations. Uh, I think it's due simply for the fact that it is the a precedent has been set by this country that when a, a uh, 
a group of people have been wronged that they should be compensated, except when it comes to African Americans, but how they would compensate um, I truly financially due to these economic shortfalls, um, how they're going to raise the funds or how they would do that and how African Americans could benefit, um, that's something that required uh, some work to determine. But, um, yeah, that's it. What do you think the, in your opinion, what do you think the goal of the Reconciliation Center should be? Well, the goal, not my understanding, the goal of Reconciliation is to uh, uh, promote awareness of uh, the events that occurred in Tulsa and uh, the uh, uh, acts of, acts against humanity and to, and by creating awareness hopefully that we won't repeat such actions and we will improve our uh, desire to be humane to one another. Would you please then describe uh, any further steps that you should, you feel should be taken to uh, further reconciliation? We've sort of talked about um, reparations. Are there any other um, efforts that could be made? Well, my personal opinion, I think uh, North Tulsa is a, a severely neglected sector of the city. Uh, it requires uh, desperate economic development. Um, and I understand, of course, uh, businesses are reluctant to um, locate in North Tulsa. However, I think uh, the city could improve its efforts on marketing North Tulsa. It markets uh, all the other sectors um, vigorously, but um, a little. I, I see a, a, a little, a lot less effort as far as marketing toward the north uh, sector. And um, again, it goes back to uh, the north sector deserves the same services and qualities and access as other sectors of the city. I know our population um, our numbers have dropped. But um, I remember when the internet uh, first came onto light and the government had all types of incentives to make sure that all communities had access to the internet. And I think the same thing should occur as far as you know, economic development, that it should be required to uh, boost development in the, uh, I don't want to say lesser, but the, well, yeah, the lesser developed sectors of the city. Uh, there are other urban areas that have been revitalized um, through CBG funds and various other actions and they've actually done well. Um, there are efforts in Tulsa and we hear about those funds but as far as uh, the actual actions or the actual um, uh, uh, I lost words here, uh, seeing the businesses come uh, there's little effort and there's lots of talks participating in uh, various city plans and and looked at various options and great ideas but they don't seem to come to fruition. When you um, describe the riot, uh, if you were to to introduce a young person to the riot, say somebody who's in their teens or perhaps even younger, um, what do you want them to know? about it? Well, um, in the various positions, I, 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 I interact with youth uh, quite regularly and I do want them to know. I don't want them to be like me and be just shocked. Uh, I, I want them to understand that the riot occurred and, and more so the, um, the history of Greenwood more so than the riot. The riot is just a piece of the history of Greenwood. I want them to know that they are uh, the abilities are uh, that, that African Americans had back in those days. And uh, by bringing up the riot, uh, basically we want them to understand that uh, people have differences. And because of those differences, it creates an element of fear in people. And sometimes people only feel the way to handle fear is through destruction or uh, 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 eliminating one group. And uh, what I try to, ex to express to them, to them is that true growth is understanding those differences, getting to know those differences, and accepting them, and not being afraid of them. I mean, uh, people, people grow, we're all products of our environment, so therefore 
the environment we come up, that molds us to who we are. But just because you're different from me, there's no need for you to fear me or me to fear you. Uh, more, more importantly, there are some things based on your different exposures that you could probably enlighten my life and I can enlighten yours based on my experiences. And so, uh, mainly to not uh, focus on fear in a negative light, but focus, focus on, on fear or differences rather as a way of enlightenment, education, broadening your horizons. You know, I tell kids all the time, you know, um, 46th Street North, 36th Street North is not the world. And try to see the world. Expo be exposed to everything you can, because you can always go back to 36th Street North. It'll be there. You can go back there if you want to be on that corner, if that's your true calling to be on that corner, you can go back. But at least go see the world first and then decide if that's what you really want. I want, to, I want to touch on one thing that you brought up, which I think is very important, which is that the story of the riot is not the entire story of the Greenwood neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us the story of the Green Na Green Greenwood neighborhood in your words? <laughs> no, uh, uh, I could could not do it justice because uh, I only know from what I've, well, partly from what I've seen and then uh, from what I've heard. And uh, I don't possess enough uh, information to tell the Greenwood story. But I can say that um, it was a very flourishing area, uh, full of pride, full of character, full of uh, just uh, energy. And uh, people uh, stood on their own two feet. Uh, it was a community, a, primarily a self-contained community that provided services for its community and uh, believed in its community and uh, that's the rich heritage is that even if you're cut off from the from other sectors of society that still doesn't mean that you have to perish that you can sustain you can improve um, african-american inventors african-american creators musicians i mean all aspects of humanity so um, just to understand that if you come across roadblocks that you're cut off doesn't mean you have to perish. That was good. Thank you. The that those are the questions I have. Have I failed to ask you about any part of um, your growing up in Tulsa? Events related to the riot? Anything else that you would like to to add? Uh, no, not that I can think of. I'm, uh, like I said, I just grew up in Tulsa. Had some very good mentors, excellent mentors. Uh, the community. The sad part about. Uh, the change in the community that I've seen is um, it used to be where a village did raise a child. So every, I mean, as you left home and wherever you went, you know, people saw you, and so therefore, if you stayed out too late or whatever, someone could report. Well, I saw him going to the store, and then he left the store, and I mean, they could just give you a track of where, you know, you where you were, and if you were misbehaving, everyone had something to say about it. As opposed to now, there's so much fear of retaliation from a parent or retaliation from the child itself that no one wants to step up and that's <clears throat> a great that's probably one of the main reasons why a lot of our youth are doing whatever they want because there's no correction and uh, we have to overcome that fear as well to try to correct our youth because um, nine times out of ten when I correct a youth uh, they're really grateful for it because they just don't know when you, um, you, you mentioned uh, you had important mentors in your life, I think this would be a great opportunity to, to say their names and it'll go down in the record for, for all ages uh, if there's anyone you'd like to. Well, the danger of saying names is that you leave someone out <laughs> and uh, I wouldn't want to discredit anyone. Uh, Moselle Lewis, um, I mean, I'm sorry, not Mo, Moselle Jones, I'm sorry. Moselle Jones, uh, attorney Waldo Jones' wife, was an excellent mentor of mine. Uh, lots of members of First Baptist Church. I grew up, I spent my early years in Union Baptist Church and uh, uh, had some great times there and lots of mentors uh, there and then transitioned eventually over to First Baptist Church where I have lots of mentors, Ms. Van, Ms. Walker, uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, 
I don't want, I'm afraid of calling names now, but uh, there, are, there are so many people that have impacted my life uh, daily that I cannot give, uh, I, I just can't give credit to all of them. I could be here for the next 40 some odd years just naming people, so yeah. Well, that's excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Okay. Our host. Well, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. What, what does this, this feel like? Is this interesting oh. to be oh, yes, part yes, of this yes, project? Yes, it is. I just hope that I, you know, don't bring it down. Oh, no, no, <laughs> no, 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 you won't. No, okay. It's a good interview. Oh, well, thank you, thank you. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you're the cameraman, you saw so. I mean, I was just here a short time and heard some quotes that I thought, oh, they'll be great on the website. Uh, absolutely. Oh, okay. to, about the About the need to well, I was, I was, and, Yeah, and I was glad that you, uh, you made that point about the neighborhood. It's something that Hannibal Johnson, I've heard him say a couple of you know, the story of the neighborhood is not only the story of the riot. Right. Mm -hmm. I right. do think that's very important. Mm -hmm. It also shouldn't be called a riot. Yeah. It really shouldn't. It's just, uh, it's it's not the right word. I don't know how, how you fix that. But. Just a, uh, I guess a, uh, what do you call it? Uh, a clean, clean word. Yeah. Because yeah. I mean, you, you don't want to say massacre. I yeah. mean, that doesn't improve the image of Tulsa. We have, you know, no. you know, I mean, you want to tell the truth, but you know, still a city. Yeah. You know, and you and and um, instances like this occur across the nation, sure. in various places. And so, do you want to destroy the city right. simply because of that? I don't know. It's, you know, you can be on both sides of that. The know. scholar that wrote the report for the National Park Service reconnaissance study told me the National Park Service wouldn't let him include this. He called it the first example of ethnic cleansing in the country. Mm -hmm. And they would, and a lot of people would agree with that. Mm -hmm. And But the National Park Service said, no, that's too inflammatory. It is, it is, it is, yeah. And that, that is pretty strong. That's that, pretty strong. That you, I, I don't think, think that's more I learned, more that's, that's pretty that radical. Accurate, but, yeah. Yeah. I don't think that's that, that accurate. I mean, I, I can, I, of course, I'm not, uh, I wasn't there. But I'm just trying to think of in the, in the minds of humanity, it, it probably was just an uprising. And because um, one group had access to more equipment, mm -hmm. then they exercised more force. You know, and, that, and that's a military, being a military man, that's a military man. You go yeah, in and, yeah. you just, mm -hmm. and you just march in, and you don't think about the, uh, how you're impacting the culture that you're taking. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a very interesting. Yeah. But I think a riot suggests a community that's just, you know, turned in on itself. It's just yeah. mass destruction. I don't think that yeah. describes no. what happened. Right. Mary of, Jones Parrish in her little book says uh, May 31st was the riot, June 1st was the invasion. Right, yeah, that's very good. And yeah. that's, an, yeah, that's, that's right. a good yeah. distinction. Yeah. I can see that more than an invasion. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So. Okay. Thank, well, thank you. you. Appreciate really nice. it. Nice to meet you. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Nice, nice to meet you. Nice to take care. Hope you'll come back and participate. Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay. Well. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Okay. Take care. All right. Thank you. Bye bye.